Ruth chapter number 4, and we'll begin our reading in verse 1. Ruth chapter number 4. Ruth chapter number 4. Ruth 4, 1 says, Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. I then said, Boaz, what day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance and the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing, for to confirm all things. A man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and to all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, I have purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that has come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel, and do thou worthy in Ephrata, and be famous in Bethlehem, and let thy house be like the house of Pharez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. Lord, I pray you bless the reading of your word. May these wonderful words of life get down deep into our heart. Lord, I pray you'd empty me of self, self-ambition, self-desire in this message, and at this time, I pray God you'd fill me with the Holy Ghost. Lord, may I exalt Christ, may I encourage and help your people. And Lord, would you please do the work that you desire to do in every heart, home, and life. And Lord, I pray that you'd magnify yourself in our sight and our hearing tonight. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Ruth chapter number 4, a rather unusual thing takes place. Uh, the setting is the city gate. Please understand when the Bible speaks of the city gate, it's talking about where the official government business of the city was done. So in Bethlehem, there's a, there's a city gate there, and a guy is going there that day, and he's going to the city gate to meet his only living relative, a man that you'd think he would know well since it's his only living relative. Um, but when he sees his only living relative come, he gets so flustered, he is so, so jabbered up inside, that he says, Oh, why, uh, 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 such a one, hey, you there, come sit down. Well, his relative comes, sits down, and Boaz starts his sales pitch. He says, look, there's a piece of land uh, that has come up for sale, and uh, you know, I thought you'd I thought I'd see if you want to buy this little scrubby piece of land. And, you know, because, I mean, if you don't buy it, I'm going to buy it because we're the only relatives there. And I, I thought you'd see if you want And the guy says, land? Man, yeah, I'd love to buy some land. They're not making any more land. I, I'll buy the land. Boaz says, oh. But then he pulls the ace out of his sleeve. He says, well, well, hang on a second. Before you make that decision, you need to understand something. Uh, this is not an ordinary land purchase we're talking about. Uh, this is a kinsman redeemer land purchase. In other words, there's a lady that comes with the land. And if you're going to buy the land, you've got to marry the lady. And the lady you've got to marry is Ruth the Moabitess. Now, at that point, the entire tone of oh, such a one changes. At that point, he says, oh, I can't do that. that. That would mar my inheritance. And the words he uses for mar my inheritance are some of the strongest words for disgust in the entire Hebrew language. He is practically throwing up on the ground. Oh, whoa, yeah, that Ruth of Moabitess. Oh, that's nasty. That's horrible. I, I could never do that. that. That's disgusting. You marry her. And Boaz says, Yeah! I get to marry Ruth. Now there are radically different reactions there at the gate that day and that catches my attention 
I want to know why one guy is throwing up on the ground just about and the other guy is, yeah, why? We're talking about the same beautiful young lady. We're talking about two Hebrew men. We're talking about the same piece of land. And yet somewhere along the line, their paths have done this number and one of them is thrilled to death to be marrying Ruth. The other one is disgusted at the thought of it. Why in the world is there that divergence of opinion? Well, in order to know that, we're going to need to go back to the beginning of the story. Now, we'll work our way through it, and I promise you, I'm not going to take long to do it. I want to get out of the way and let the bride preach. But let's go back to the beginning of this. In Ruth chapter number 1, we find a setting that is taking place during the time period of the book of the Judges. That's where Ruth sits as far as time goes. It's a dark time in Israel. There, there are people being raped and killed in the streets and blaspheming and making idols and then, then one minute later praising God for the idols they've made. It's a wicked time. Twice the Bible says every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It doesn't get any darker than that time period in the book of the Judges in which Ruth is set. Well, during that time period, there's a family in Bethlehem. Uh, the man's name is Elimelech. The wife's name is Naomi. They got a couple of boys, Malon and Chilion. There is a famine in the land during that time period. And, and this man, Elimelech, the head of the family, makes the worst imaginable decision. He says to the family, we are going to pick up stakes. We are leaving Bethlehem, God's country. We are going to go down to Moab for a while. Now that no doubt shocked his family beyond measure because Moab was a forbidden people in a forbidden land. They were the inveterate, constant enemies of Israel. They weren't supposed to be having anything to do with them. So that had to shock his family. But he justifies it by saying, listen, we are just going to sojourn there. To sojourn means to visit for a while. We're not just, we're not just digging down roots there. We're, we're not planning on living there. We're just going to visit there for a while. Listen to me, before you ever get out of God's will, you better realize that sojourn becomes permanent before you know it. When they go down there to sojourn and sojourn becomes continued and continued becomes, becomes they dwell down there. And finally, Elimelech, the husband who planned on coming home with his family, dies there in Moab. Now there's a grave on that eastern side of the Jordan River and he never does make it back across to go home. Well, the boys are getting used to things in Moab. As a matter of fact, they have, they've set their eyes on a couple of Moabite girls. One of them has met a girl named Ruth. The other one has met a girl named Orpa, And they end up marrying these girls. Well, they live there 10 years after they marry these girls and then another disaster strikes. Both of the boys, Malon and Chilion, die. Now there's just Naomi left of the original family and she hears that God has visited his people and sending bread to Bethlehem. So she decides she's going to go back home to where they never should have left to start with. So she says to her daughters-in-law, girls, y'all go back home to your family, your gods, your stuff, your ways. I'm, I'm going back to Bethlehem. Now initially, they both protest that they are going with her and that nothing can change their minds. But then Naomi begins to lay out the case and she says, No girls, listen to me, you need to understand what you're facing here. There are no more sons coming up in my womb. That's not going to happen. And if I could, you wouldn't be willing to stay for them until they grew up. And so there's no, more, there's no more sons coming from Naomi to marry you. And you're Moabites and nobody else is going to have anything to do with you back there in, in, in Bethlehem. If there were some other relatives and they could be as a kinsman redeemer to you, they'd be, they'd be obligated by the law, as it were, to marry you. But there's nobody else there. My family line is done and cut off. You can't expect any, any family. You can't expect any kindness or anybody else to fall in love with you there, they're not going to have anything to do with you, so, so you don't need to come. Now, when Orpah hears this, the Bible says that she, she decides to go back. They have both initially kissed their mother-in-law and said that I'm not going, but when she hears that she has nothing for her there, she turns around she goes back. And Naomi acknowledges to Ruth she has, she's gone back to her gods. Ruth, she's expecting her to go back too, but Ruth has another mindset about her. Ruth says, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to go back from following after thee. Whether thou goest, I will go. Whether thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people will be my people. Thy God, my God. Where thou diest, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also. If aught but death part between me and thee. So the Bible says that when Naomi saw she was steadfastly minded to go, she left off speaking to her. Ruth has said in so many words, I know what you've said. I know you don't have any more sons coming up. I know those, there's no more potential kinsmen redeemers out there. I know I'm facing widowhood. I know I'm facing poverty. I know I'm facing starvation. But I've come to know your God, and I'm going back where you came from. Your God's going to be my God. I'm following him. Yeah. 
So she's following Naomi, yes, but she's really following Naomi's God that she has come to know. Well, then in chapter 1, they come back to Bethlehem. They are there during the, the early parts of the wheat harvest. They come back. The Bible says that all of the city is moved about Naomi. They say, is this Naomi? Is Naomi back home? Naomi immediately begins to bristle because her name means sweetness. And she used to be sweet, but her entire attitude has changed now. She says, don't you ever call me that again. Don't call me Naomi. I'm not sweet-spirited. I'm not tender-hearted. Call me Mara because I'm bitter. She said, I went out full. God brought me home empty. And it always strikes me that now she's admitting that she went out full. They didn't leave because they didn't have anything. They left because they were afraid that if they stayed one day, they might not have anything. They, they left on everything but faith. But now she's back, and the city's moved about her. She doesn't want to be called Naomi. She wants to be called Mara. So everybody just sort of dissipates, goes her way. And now Ruth and Naomi have faced the reality of the life they're going to have there in Bethlehem. They are in debt over their head. There is no provider there in the home, but somebody's got to put food on the table. So as chapter 2 starts, Ruth begins to speak to Naomi. Ruth knows uh, the customs and the laws of Israel. She says, look, let me go out and glean in the field of him whose eyes I find grace because I know the law of Moses says that I, I'm allowed as a stranger, a foreigner, just to pick up that which is left on the plant or that falls on the ground. So just let me go out and work. I'll provide for this family. Naomi says, go ahead. Well, the Bible says that, that her hap, we would say her happenstance, was to light in the portion of a field belonging to a man by the name of Boaz. Now, she doesn't know this. She has no idea who Boaz is or that there is a Boaz. She just, just by, in her view, coincidence, happens to land in that field. You know, it's interesting. When you follow God, you have the most amazing coincidences. It's called the providence of God. Well, she just so happens to land in this field, and she goes to work. From early morning, she goes to work, and she is really picking them up and putting them down, so much so that the foreman has, has noticed her work ethic and her character. Well, by and by, towards the end of the day, Boaz, the owner of the field, comes in, and Boaz says to his workers, the Lord be with you. Now, wouldn't you love to work at a job where just as a normal course of things, the boss shows up and says, the Lord be with you. This isn't church we're talking about. This is not Bible college. It's a secular work setting. The Lord be with you. And they're so used to it. It's not a put on with him. They're so used to it. They answer, the Lord bless thee. And then Boaz says, <laughs> it's that girl. Now listen to me. He is, he's not surprised to see a girl in the field because the law of Moses allows this. This is a normal thing. He later observes and he says to her, I have told the young men not to touch you. Now, I'm not trying to be unkind, but if she is like four foot nine by four foot nine by 490 pounds and buck teeth so bad she can eat corn on the cob to a picket fence, you don't have to say that. They're like, we're good, boss. Sorry, but we're not touching her, I promise. <laughs> this is an attractive woman. Bo has noticed her. Who is that girl out there? And the foreman says, boss, that is Ruth the Moabitess who came back with Naomi. She had been working in the field from early morning until now that she just now came to tarry in the house a little bit. If I could paraphrase it, he is saying that girl has got character and despair. One of the hardest workers I've ever seen. Loved to have a field full of people just like her. But boss, she is a Moabitess. Ruth hears Boaz begin to speak. He says to, Bo to Ruth, he says, hearest thou not my daughter? Go not into any other field. Just stay here fast by my maidens. And, and when it comes meal time, you just sit down here at our table and you just, we'll, we'll just hand you some bread and you dip your bread in the vinegar and we'll reach you some parched corn. And don't you worry about going to draw a well from that big old well, the water from that big old well in Bethlehem. I got some employees here. They'll draw all the water up and you just take all the water you want. And she realizes he is being lavishly kind to her. He's going way above what the law of Moses demands. In other words, Boaz could have said, all right, look, you're allowed to be there in the field, Moabitess, but that's all you're allowed to do. And don't you be talking to any of our folks and, uh, and don't you be reaching out for the corn. No, Boaz is taking the opposite approach. He is saying, look, it's before, what, what's mine is yours. We're going to take real good care of you. You make sure that you just have all the water and food you need. She says, thank you for letting me find grace in your sight. She goes back out to the field to go to work and Boaz has a quick business meeting. He calls the boys in. He says, fellas, you know, I've always told you, I expect you to give me an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. Yeah, boss, yeah, boss, yeah. You know, I've always told you, I expect you to be incredibly efficient. Yeah, boss, yeah. You know, I've always told you, I expect you not to waste anything. Yeah, boss, yeah. Forget all that. 
I'm telling you today, drop stuff in front of that girl. I mean, make it like it's flinging itself in a basket by magic. What I'm telling you is, if you do a good job today, you're all fine. <laughs> They've got to think Boaz has lost his mind. Boaz hadn't lost his mind. He just found something a lot more interesting than money and business. When Ruth leaves that day, she leaves with seven and a half pounds of food, uh, seven and a half gallons of food, rather, en enough food for two people for five days' time. That's not a normal thing. So when she comes home, Naomi realizes somebody's been really, really kind to her, and she says, who has taken notice of you? Blessed be he of the Lord. And, and Ruth says, oh, the guy's name, yeah, the guy's name was uh, Bubba, Bobby, Barney, uh, Boaz, Boaz. The guy's name is, is, is Boaz. And, and Naomi says, Boaz? Boaz, you can't be serious. Boaz is still alive. The man is near of kin to us, next of kinsmen. She uses one word, a general word for kin when she starts. She uses a very specific word the second time around. That specific word is the word goel. goel. It means a kinsman redeemer. She's saying, Ruth, this thing that I told you we didn't have any more of, this person who could marry you and raise up seed to you to husband, this is one of those guys. Ruth, for her part, doesn't seem to be getting it because she says, well, he he told me to stay back fast in his field by his maidens. And you can almost hear her, hear Naomi put on the brakes. Because she knows she's going too fast. She says, it is good for thee, my daughter, that thou go not into any other field, that his maidens find thee not in any other field. <laughs> and she just sort of backs off. And then day after day, Ruth goes to work. And she does this for two solid months. Two months to the end of the barley harvest, she does this. And after two months of working, after two months of Naomi observing how well Boaz is treating her. After two months of her seeing how kind Boaz has been, and after two months of Boaz seeing her character, Naomi says, Ruth, my daughter, uh, shall I not seek to be, things to be wealthy? She says, she says this, this man Boaz you've been working for, this man's a near, near of kin. He could be a kinsman redeemer. Ruth, I, I want you to do something. She says in so many words, I want you to propose to Boaz. She says, they're going to be having... The end of the harvest prophet gathering and fellowship, as it were. They're going to be threshing and winnowing late into the night. It's prophet taking day, the happiest day of the year. They'll have a big fellowship, big party there. Everybody's going to be there. She says, I know you want to go to bed. I know you're tired, you're hot, you're sweaty. You just want to sleep. Forget that. Get on the best clothes you got. Put on the eau de parfum. Go back down there. And then she says, but make not thyself known to the man. In other words... Just be sort of coy. Be like, hey. She says, but, but when everybody else goes to sleep, he's going to fall asleep there on the floor, and you go and uncover his feet and lay down at his feet. Now, can you imagine the reaction if you tell a modern feminist that? Oh, I don't think so. Don't you tell me to lay down the stinking fungus filled feet of some stinking man. Don't you know woman's as good as any five men? Oh, no. But Ruth has quite a different spirit about her. Ruth says, all that you've been me to do, I'll do. Whew. Sweet spirited girl. She goes down there just like Naomi has said. There's a party go on, but, but Boaz looks at her. Hey, how you doing? And she, just, she lets, lets the party go on. And finally everybody goes to sleep. And she goes in there and she uncovers his feet. And she, she lays down at his feet. And the Bible says at midnight, the man woke up and was afraid. Because I don't care who you are, how tough you are. You wake up at midnight, somebody's in your room, you're going to be afraid too. <laughs> Boaz says, who's down there? And he hears a familiar voice say, it's Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread your skirt over thy handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. Now, unless you get the wrong idea, uh, skirt's not a skirt, obviously, like, like we would think of a lady wearing today. That uh, skirt was the fringe edge of the garment. There was another word for it. It was used in chapter 2, verse 12, where Boaz said, you've come to trust under the wings of the God of Israel. It's the exact same word. She was saying, spread your wings, spread that garment edge over me, that skirt over me, because I want to come under your protection and your authority. I'm asking you to marry me. Since you haven't approached me, I'm approaching you. I want to be yours. Boaz, Boaz says, fear not, my daughter. Oh, the daughter of my people know thou art a virtuous woman. I will do everything you've said. In other words, she said, will you marry me? He said, yeah. <laughs> That's good. But the next word is, how be it? Or we'd say, but. Now, girls, here's the thing. 
If there's a proposal somewhere in the wings and the word but occurs anywhere, there's probably a problem. <laughs> yeah, I'll marry you, but. All right, guys, you're probably, you're probably, probably having trouble right there. I'm just telling you. He says, I'll marry you, but how be it? How be it? There's a nearer kinsman than I. Remember that guy at the gate? Oh, such a one. There's a nearer kinsman than I. Ruth is now on a roller coaster. She has come to Bethlehem expecting that there's nobody that can marry her. And then she's met a guy who could marry her. And then she's taken two months falling in love with this guy who could marry her. And then he's agreed to marry her. And then he says, but there's some other guy that if he wants to, has a right to marry you. If he won't marry you, I'll marry you. But he gets first crack at it. In other words, she knows she's about to be married. She just doesn't know to who. She doesn't know if she's going to get married to this guy that she's now fallen heavily in love with or to some troll that she's never met before. She has no idea. <laughs> Boaz says, I will do everything you've said. How be there's a near kinsman than I. He says, but don't worry. He said, I'll take care of this tomorrow. Just stay at my feet for a few more hours. Dangerous out there in the street. You can't be out there in the street right now. Horrible time. Remember the time period we're talking about. Just stay at my feet for a few more hours. You do realize, by the way, that we're just staying at the Lord's feet for a few more hours until the wedding day. You do understand that, don't you? Man, every, every time we meet together, we're just staying at his feet for a few more hours till he comes for wedding day. He says, stay at my feet for a few more hours. Well, they get up very early in the morning, and, and he says, don't let it be known that a woman came under the threshing floor. Don't want anybody talking. He says, but bring me your veil. She brings the veil, and he loads her up with 15 gallons of food. She's now carrying home twice as much as she carried home on the first day, enough for two people for 10 days. And he says, uh, don't go empty to your mother-in-law. In other words, he is saying in so many words, I know that Naomi is behind all this. <laughs> Tell her I said thank you. <laughs> so he sends Ruth home with all this food. He has to load it up onto her shoulder. She comes home, and Naomi's not expecting her. So Naomi asks something odd. She says, who art thou, my daughter? Sort of an odd question. What she's saying is, who are you? I didn't expect you back. Are you the woman who was rejected? Are you the woman who was told, uh, I've got to think about it for a while? Who are you? What is going on? And she says, well, he told me that he would marry me. But then he told me there's somebody else. Naomi's got to be going, seriously? I didn't think there was any of them. And now there's two of them? She says, sit here, my daughter. For the man will not be in rest until he finishes the thing this day. And then you come to chapter 4 where we began. Boaz goes to the city gate. He's meeting his only living relative. Guy that y'all know pretty well. Only living relative shows up. Hey, you, uh, 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 such, uh yeah, yeah, such one, come sit down. Oh, such one, come sit down. Boaz says, oh, look, this piece of land's come up for sale. A little scrubby piece of land. Thought I'd see if you want to buy it. Because if you don't buy it, I'm going to buy it. We're the only ones that can buy it. Oh, yeah, land. They're not making any more land. I'd love to buy the land. Boaz said, well, hang on a second. Not just normal purchase we're talking about. It's the kinsman redeemer purchase. See, there's a lady that comes with the land. If you buy the land, you've got, you got to marry the lady. And the lady is Ruth the Moabite. It's, oh, no. Not Ruth the Moabite. Oh, 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 that's, that, that's horrible. That, that's disgusting. I can't do that. You do it. Boaz. Yeah! Said all that to say this. There was such a radical difference in their reactions but ho such a one's reactions were the normal, expected reactions of any Jewish man in that day. He was just doing what any normal Jewish man would do. It wasn't him that had changed. It was Boaz that had changed. So why and how did God change Boaz's heart so drastically, and yet that other guy didn't have a bit of change in his heart and any kind thoughts toward Ruth? Can I tell you why? Go back to the beginning of the story. I got a question. In, Mo, in Moab, exactly how many young women were there that needed a kinsman redeemer? Back in Bethlehem, exactly how many potential kinsman redeemers were there? The reason how such a one reacted that way to Ruth is because he wasn't for Ruth. He was for Orpah. If Orpah had come back, in other words, if Orpah had come to Bethlehem with them, the same God that softened Boaz's heart to Ruth could have just as easily softened his heart to Orpah. But Orpah looked ahead and said, I don't see any way this is going to work, this following God thing. So I'm not going to follow. She disappears, and there is no book of Orpah in the Bible. Ruth 
sees the same set of circumstances. He says, I don't see any way it can work, but I'm following God anyway. I just trust Him. I, I don't know the details. I don't see any possibility of how it can work. But I know this God now, and I trust Him enough to follow even when I don't understand. The title of the message, by the way, is Enough for Orpah. Here's the point. You will face abundant times in your life where following God doesn't seem to make an ounce of sense. And you look ahead at all the details as you know them. And you think, God, I don't see how that's going to work. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please Him. God puts you in situations like that to give you only two choices. Follow Him by faith or not follow at all. God is intent on us learning to follow by faith. And the people that follow by faith learn something. There's always enough. There's always enough. There's always enough. God's already got it all prepared. There's always enough. You're going to face times in your life where you think, Lord, are you sure? I'm going to tell you something. If you'll take roots, approach, find out something. There's always enough. Our church is doing really, really well right now. Probably the best ever. Please, Lord, keep it that way. Hallelujah. <laughs> doing really well right now, but several years ago, went through a really hard time, especially financially. In addition to being in a hard time financially, the pews started breaking. See, the pews were 25 years old when we got them. A church gave them to us, and they were made out of pasteboard. And I don't know about folks around here, but the folks in Mooresboro, North Carolina, are healthy people. <laughs> and I'd be preaching, and I'd hear, pop, and I'd see a head go. <laughs> and I realized, I got another pew fix. People slide in the middle like birds on a line, man. And <laughs> so I'd spend next week fixing the pew. And it got to where they were breaking faster than I could fix them. So I did what any preacher ought to do. I started praying. Lord, what would, you, what would they have us to do? And I was real sure the Lord said, buy brand new interlocking chairs the entire auditorium. And I said, Lord, is there anybody else I can talk to? <laughs> I knew the finances weren't going to allow that. No, oh, I, I want you to buy interlocking chairs for the auditorium. All right, Lord. We'll try if that's what you want. I went to the church full of faith. All right, if you would like to buy a, buy a chair for the church, there are X number of dollars. Let's, everybody buy a chair for the church. We had you know, 25, 30 chair worth of money come in. And, and we did some fundraisers here and there to get some money to come in. It just, it just wasn't coming in. People still pop. pop. <laughs> we had an old church, an old school bus in the side yard. It had been sitting over there with, a, with an engine that wouldn't even turn over for a year. Old 60 passenger school bus. Somebody gave it to us. It died in the yard and never could get it to start, so we just left it there. Metal was pretty high at the time. Uh, I thought, I wonder how much we could get if we scrapped that bus. So I checked it out. It was pretty, pretty high. So I called my mechanic. I said, Mike, I got a question. If I wanted to get that bus started, and if I really want to get it started, how can I get it started? He said, you can't. I said, come on, man, throw me a bone here. Look, if I was really, really anxious to get started, give me something to try. He said, I'm telling you, you can't. Come on, man, help me out here. Give me, give me just a sliver of hope. He said, look, preacher, it's been locked up for more than a year now. It's not going to start, but if you've got all the time in the world, go pour fuel in the carburetor, hook up to the biggest jumper cables you can hook up to, let it run for a while, fight, try to fire it up, but I'm telling you it's not going to start. So I got a truck out there and big gigantic jumper cables, hooked it up to it, let it run for a while, poured some, poured some fuel in it. My, my, my wife is there going, I'm telling you, it's not going to start. Glory to God. Thank you for the help, baby. I appreciate that. So, <laughs> so I'm telling you, but, but she said, it's not going to start. What are you gonna? I said, we're going to try it and see. And, and, and so, so, so I got inside it and I grabbed that key and I turned it and it went, <laughs> and it fired up. Big plume of black smoke filled the sky. Looked like Hiroshima or Nagasaki, man. <laughs> My wife said, what are you going to do now? I said, get behind me in the vehicle. <laughs> she said, you don't have a CDL that doesn't have a tag. I said, stay real close behind me in the vehicle. <laughs> we whipped that thing out into the highway. She's riding my bumper with the Yukon. Parts were literally falling off of it. I'm not making up. I watched the muffler roll into the dish, man. And I'm praying, dear God, please don't let anybody get killed. I'll be under a jail forever. Please don't let it break down. I got 12 miles to go to get to the scrapyard. 12 miles, I've made it 11 miles, and now I know there are people always on the scale. So I'm praying, Lord, please, don't let there be anybody on the scale. I slam the gas, whip it in there. There's nobody on the scale. Slam the gas again. Arr, 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 arr. It died on the scale. They couldn't restart it. They had to push it off with an excavator. Not my problem. We got it there. 
$1,420 later, we got it there. I went to church that Sunday. <coughs> I told the story. I told them how many more chairs we're going to buy with that $1,400. And everybody just shouting, having a great time. And on the way out that day, a young college girl was there. And you know that college kids have like all kinds of money, right? Yeah. College girl was there. She's been visiting for two weeks. She said, Preacher, how much more would it take to buy all the chairs? I told her how much. It was like $4,200 we still had left to get. She said, well, I'm going to give a little something towards that. I said, I appreciate that. She went off somewhere and wrote a check and handed it to my wife. And we finished shaking hands. And after we finished shaking hands, Diane took the check and went, $4,200. God said, buy those chairs. I said, God, I don't see any way. I don't see any way. And yet when we followed him, God just showed us that he had enough for us. That's a small illustration. I guarantee many of you have many, many bigger ones than that, but I'm just telling you. Those times where you know what God wants, it's real clear, but you don't see a way that it can work, just go with it. Just go with it. You can walk in faith like Ruth and end up doing something spectacular for God and seeing Him work in a great way. You can disappear into obscurity like Orpah, never to be heard from again, and miss what God had for you all along. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your arm for all you've done. We love you, appreciate you. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, thank you that in my 49 years I've learned that I can trust you. Thank you for never letting me down. I sure appreciate it. Lord, there's probably some here tonight that are facing some things and they don't know how it's going to work out. Lord, would you please remind them that there's always enough you please remind them you're already ahead of them and that you have things waiting for them when they get there? Lord, just help us to walk by faith. I want to commit it to your hands for the doing thereof. In Christ's name, amen.